Hello to everyone who's listening again. Um, last time we talked about um, an introductory um, discussion through what psychology is and why it, um, it's valuable to study, how it's relevant for other people, and how to study it in general. So now I guess we're um, exploring uh, a more focused aspect of psychology. And uh, it's interesting that this is the first module after the introduction to psychology, which is the biological perspectives of psychology. I remember, ma'am, when I started taking physiological psychology, it was quite intimidating because there are a lot of scientific mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of about neurons and brain structures. So for the everyday student who we don't want to intimidate with all of these higher scientific terms, how can we see the importance of studying the biopsychological perspective in the context of just everyday life. Okay, so like I said in the last uh, podcast that we recorded, mm -hmm. I think I even got a little bit excited because mm -hmm. this is actually one of my favorite topics mm -hmm. of, of psych. And I am I'm not, <laughs> I am the student that shifted out to be a psych because I decided, oh, I don't want to take all these extra uh, science courses. <laughs> but it ended up, um, being um, one of my favorite uh, parts of psychology and because it's so relevant to my practice mm -hmm. uh, it's so relevant to my understanding of people and it's so relevant to my understanding of myself and like how is that mm -hmm. because uh, like I said er, um, before uh, our bodies is our we are here all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> in our bodies mm -hmm. um, hopefully. Uh, and, and the more we understand how our bodies uh, take, um, play a part and the part and how the interaction with our thoughts and our emotions um, are directly like found right. and yes. rooted yes. and cased in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And actually knowing more about that helps us gain some kind of um, well, a, a, one, a deeper awareness of ourselves, uh, like, aside from the what we are, <laughs> um, it, I think it also adds to our understanding of the who we are mm -hmm. and, and why we do what we do. Um, and uh, maybe just a little throwback to, like, the goals of psychology, you know, why, why do we uh, want to study this, these things? Well, we want to be able to um, uh, understand, you know, uh, you know, observe, ask questions, um, try something out, okay, like, you know, experiment, you know, learn new hypotheses, and then have some measure of control, okay, so that's good in the broad uh, scheme of things with psychology, but that's also good for us as, as individuals, knowing how behaviors or thoughts or moods are related to real physical um, activity of our organs, of our uh, brain parts. <laughs> um, if we know that, and then we know how, for example, uh, to regulate a certain behavior through our bodies, then that gives us uh, more control over ourselves. And so, yeah, and I guess to me personally, what that gives me is a sense of um, a sense of strength, okay, mm -hmm. a, a sense of my own personal power, uh, and therefore maybe a sense of security that hey, you know, um, like for example, I give a very uh, practical example. Um, because of my knowledge of um, biopsych, you know, my knowledge of the HPA axis, for example, my knowledge of the amygdala, my knowledge of how the amygdala affects the body. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, I know how to handle my own anxieties. Mm -hmm. okay? When I get anxious or I get nervous, I know what to do to signal to my own body, hey, it's okay. Hey, it's okay. Um, and then I know what to do. Like, for example, I know to lengthen my breaths, um, lengthen my exhales, because I know that will regulate my heart rate. 
because I know I want to slow down my heart rate if I want to feel better and more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Things like this. You uh, to know these things, you have to know. You have to have a basic knowledge of your your biology, your hardware, and the effects in life are very apparent and very clear. Mm -hmm. If I know how to manage my nervousness, then there's so many things that I can do that maybe before I couldn't do. So that's why it really is, um, maybe at first glance, it's like, uh, you know, science mm -hmm. and terms and memorization. But after a while, what I hope is that it just becomes like, oh yeah, that's right. It's like knowing um, that if you do this with your hands, you will grasp something. Uh, you know that if you exhale in a particular way, you'll relax. Um, so there, I hope it ends up being something quite practical mm -hmm. and quite useful. So you're saying there's a very, uh, the body and the mind are very interconnected. And by understanding our own physical sensations and the structures that allow us to think and process emotions and we get to have a sense of control and yes. not just the control but also an understanding of why we think the way we do what is memory mm -hmm. right um how do we learn mm -hmm. um uh, all of the questions that you could ask about memory you could ask about um you know encoding and um uh, retrieval of memories etc all of those occur and happen in the brain Okay. All of those occur and happen through experiences we feel and process with our sensorial um, organs, mm -hmm. with our sensory organs. So yes, all of that is rooted in the body. If we talk about the development of the human person, well, we talk about what happens uh, to a person as they grow up, as they are, the, you know, from this small until they are like, you know, five foot two mm -hmm. and... 32 years old, okay? Mm -hmm. And all of those, uh, the stages of development also follow the physical development of a person. Mm -hmm. it, it follows the same um, structure, the same, mm -hmm. or at least, the, at the very least, the same time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing certain changes, although we, of course, we will not go through every little mm -hmm. thing, okay? But for example, knowing how, how as a child, um, there were so many more connections in our brain, okay, that as we grow up, we lose, okay, through the pro a process called pruning, okay, and that's why child experiences and child memories are not the same as adult experiences and adult memories. Mm -hmm. um, so there, that's actually mm -hmm. something that you act uh, you might not even learn that in the modules here, but later on when you take up dev psych. But having a good uh, grounding in physiological psych uh, or, or bio psych will help, will really help you understand every other psych uh, mm -hmm. subject. Like, for example, if you're in psych to know about uh, human behavior, uh, mm -hmm. so you're interested in personality, why don't we just study personality? Mm -hmm. Well, because human behavior uh, is also rooted in. Um, the frontal cortex, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the part of the brain where you make most of your an analysis, where you make most of your decisions, mm -hmm. um, where emotions like love mm -hmm. and emotions like obsession mm -hmm. or emotions like fear, where are those? How do you find them in your brain? Uh, well, that's what this module is for. Mm -hmm. And actually, I hope we'll get to talk about those. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Um, let's start with um, our ability to be aware of things as humans. How is that rooted in neural activity? For example, how does neural activity dictate processes we are aware of versus processes that we are unaware of? Okay. All right. <laughs> so now we're, we're, we're going to start talking about particular yes. parts of the brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All we're right. ready. We're ready. All right. So what is... What's the, what, what's the main question? So um, what nervous system structures or neural structures allow us to be aware of things? Aware. Okay, so we're talking about awareness. Awareness. So the moment you say that word, what do we actually mean when we say awareness? So one particular kind of awareness, which I guess we'll, I'll focus on for this answer, 
is our awareness of our external world, okay? And when we say, I'm aware of what's happening around me, you're talking about a few things. You're talking about what you can see. You're talking about what you can hear. You're talking about what you can feel, okay? Maybe sometimes you even notice what you can taste. <laughs> but that's not active usually unless you're eating or unless you're by the beach and you stick out your tongue and like, oh, the air smells like, as tastes like salt, okay? So... Um, but the point is that we use our sensory organs, okay, to be aware of anything, any experience, okay. So, um, what we need to remember is that our sensory organs are, we, we have senses because of our neurons, okay, and neurons are these specialized kinds of cells that are connected to um, sensory receptors, okay? And you can just think of receptors as like entry points, okay? So you have receptors in your eyes, you have receptors in your nose, you have receptors in your ears, you have receptors all over your skin, but particularly uh, in your hands, okay? That's why our hands are very sensitive and can, can really feel texture more than, for example, your elbow. <laughs> Your elbow can feel texture the same way your hands can feel texture because your hands have more receptors, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the receptors connect to neurons, okay? And then the neurons, imagine the neurons are like, um, uh, you know those toys with like the... With their... The monkeys. Connect, like, like, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like hooks yeah. that are connected. Right. So neurons are like that. They connect to each other mm -hmm. and then they form these cables of connections mm -hmm. that are what we uh, call, uh, those are our nerves. Mm -hmm. So our nerves are made by these connected neurons and that's how um, information travels mm -hmm. through the body. So that's mm -hmm. how I can touch something like uh, this rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow, that's and a I can rock. feel <laughs> I can feel the texture of this rock, mm -hmm. and I can feel it of you know with the tip of my finger. But because of the receptors there, and then the neurons that are connected, and the nerves mm -hmm. that uh, are made up of neurons that connect from my finger all the way to my spinal cord, mm -hmm. and my spinal cord is connected uh, through. Uh, those are also bundles of neurons mm -hmm. connects to my brain. Mm -hmm. The sense of touch, okay, will be sent to the brain mm -hmm. for the brain to know, okay, you are touching something mm -hmm. rough, okay, mm -hmm. like this rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same neurons, uh, receptors in the eyes um, uh, detect light, okay, and the variations of light depending on which receptors are activated, that's how I can see color, okay? So the receptors in the back of the eye send signals through neurons um, to the brain, mm -hmm. okay? And same with hearing, okay? Um, and all of those uh, sensory information, okay? Um, kind of like a, a computer, it has to be translated into a form that the body understands. Mm -hmm. And the language of the body is uh, actually, interestingly, electrical impulses. Ah, so we're so, almost like computers. We're way. almost like computers. Yes. Um, and the electrical impulses are passed from neuron to neuron. Okay. So there is what is called an excitatory response, okay? And excitatory just means it go, it turns on and it sends a signal to the next neuron to turn on and release that and, and so on so that the signal will reach the brain, mm -hmm. okay? Where it will get extra processing. Mm -hmm. um, right, and so that's mm -hmm. how any information travels through the body mm -hmm. and to the brain, mm -hmm. right? And that is the first step of what we call awareness. You are aware of anything, everything that you're aware of is because of these, uh, this particular phenomenon called the neural impulse, okay? 
uh, which is basically um, the neuron sends a mm -hmm. signal to the next mm -hmm. neuron mm -hmm. and that sends a signal to the next neuron, etc. So the signal is called the neural impulse. Okay? Mm -hmm. So right now, my brain is working. Your brain is working. Mm -hmm. your, your neurons are firing neural impulses mm -hmm. so that you can listen to what I'm saying, so mm -hmm. that you can see that I'm wearing purple eyeshadow. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, right? So that's the beginning of the work, okay? From our sensory receptors, sensory organs to the brain. Mm -hmm. And now, but how do we actually uh, register any of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, some some of the nerves, okay, send signals to the spinal cord. Okay. So if I feel something with my feet, actually even with my fingers, it goes into the spinal cord. All right. Okay? And then the spinal cord is connected to the brain. Mm -hmm through the brainstem, okay? So, um, so information enters- The okay, receptors, the so from the environment to yeah. the receptors, and then it goes through the through neurons, neurons, to the neurons, the nerves, mm -hmm. all the way to the brain, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, there are various parts of the brain that takes into account this information. Because can you imagine if you're just accepting information all the time? Mm -hmm. it's right um, now you're probably paying lot, attention to yes at to least your I'm, screen <laughs> to you to you right. speaking through my screen so right. um it's a lot of there's a lot to take in uh sensor sensorially so like the light yeah, coming right. from uh shining on my face and your voice yeah. and the uh the image of you on my screen so right. how does it feel? And there could be actually noises outside mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I hear my right. dog barking yeah. outside. Right. So, yeah. Right. But so how can you actually pay attention to, to anything or anyone? And that's what the brain is for. Okay. The brain has its own way of managing all of this so that we can pay attention. And one important part okay, of that is found in the brain stem. Okay, and it's this particular part of the brain called the reticular formation. Okay. Right. Reticular, <laughs> formation. reticular formation is a part of the brain that's in charge of selective attention. Mm -hmm. So it allows uh, it allows your brain to pick up on particular things that it wants to pay attention to, like for example, sight right now, mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at me, or 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 uh, sound, okay, mm -hmm. if you're hearing. And it will say, focus on this. And it will actually push all the other information to the background okay? so, so that you won't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. That's why even in a noisy room, for example, there's the noise of like the air conditioning mm -hmm. or the noise of your dog barking. Um, it can sound like it's silent, even if there is actually the sensorial um, It's sound. still being picked up. It's yes. still being picked up, but your reticular formation allows it to be drowned out, to be in the background and not and not the thing you are paying attention to, right? Okay. So isn't that interesting? Yes. There's a part of your brain that's in charge of that. And if, um, so you can imagine if that part of your brain was mm -hmm. working very well, well, you'd have a hard time. Mm -hmm. You'd have a hard time anything. focusing or not being able to, yeah, uh, focus on one task. Mm -hmm. Right, you would be bombarded by stimuli mm -hmm. that you couldn't regulate. Okay, another thing. So the reticular phase uh, for uh, reticular formation is in what is called the hind brain. It's in the back. It's here yeah. actually. All right. Know, if you touch the back of your neck, mm -hmm. uh, there are other parts there that are quite uh, interesting too. Okay. See, when you talk about awareness, you're usually talking about what you're paying attention to, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is, you're alive because you don't have to pay attention to certain things. You don't have to pay attention to your heart beating. You don't have to pay attention to your lungs, okay? Mm -hmm. Inhaling and exhaling, and mm -hmm. uh, um, inflating and deflating. You don't have to pay attention to your heart rate, mm -hmm. okay? Because there are parts of your brain that automatically handle that for you, mm -hmm. okay? So 
that is below your awareness. Okay? But it's important to know that it's there um, because otherwise we wouldn't be alive <laughs> if we needed to pay attention to those. Mm -hmm. So that's where the parts of your brain, uh, like the medulla, okay, the medulla oblongata, it's there also, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, the medulla is uh, in charge of uh, respiration, mm -hmm heart rate mm -hmm. uh, and I think also swallowing mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. these basic life functions okay there's also a uh, part of the brain they're called the cerebellum mm -hmm. okay and the cerebellum is in charge of little things like keeping your neck up keeping your back mm -hmm. uh, upright and all of those because um, yeah if you needed to take control of all your muscles all the time then that's where all your attention will be. Yes. <laughs> right? So without thinking about it, just by being active there, you can sit up. And, uh, well, me, I can sit up. I don't know what they're doing <laughs> as they're watching this. Okay. Um, other parts of the brain. Uh, there's this part there also called the pons. Okay? And the pons is in charge of regulating um, balance, and coordination left and right body coordination mm -hmm. and also waking okay mm -hmm. um you uh, waking and sleeping is regulated by the pond so if you're awake right now which i hope you are yeah. um yeah. then you are awake because there's that little part of the brain that regulates your being awake and your being asleep okay? mm -hmm. it's there so that's those are the parts of the the hindbrain, okay? So lots of things there that are just in charge of just making, getting your body to work as normal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this little part, the articular formation that helps you uh, pay attention to a thing, okay? And so, so on. Um, but again, we're talking about awareness, mm -hmm. okay? We're talking about conscious experience. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we hardly are ever conscious of, but they're there. And they do the work for us so that we don't have to be conscious of it. But then, so let's follow the movement of the neurons that, mm. that are in charge of our um, senses, right? Because that's mainly what makes our awareness experience. So, um, so from the hind brain, we go through, uh, for example, the sensory experience, um, we, uh, uh, the reticular formation and things in the hindbrain, structures in the hindbrain allow us to focus on the stimuli at hand mm -hmm. or the task at hand and to keep our bodies alive and functioning, just the basic mm -hmm. um, things that we like, our heart and our ability to keep upright. So what comes after that? Um, what comes after that actually is what we call the, the midbrain, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's where, um, well, the, the key part of that is the thalamus, okay? Mm -hmm. Because um, all the sensory neuro, um, the nerves that carry our sensory information, they go through the thalamus. Mm -hmm. The thalamus is like a, a big train station that directs mm -hmm. all these sensory uh, information, nerves, mm -hmm. uh, impulses to go to their proper places. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's go through the thalamus first and then say, how does the thalamus, where does the thalamus send this experience that is now happening? So the visual uh, stimuli will be sent to what's called the occipital lobe, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the back of your head. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's that's okay. where visual stimuli is processed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in the cortex, mm -hmm. the, the outer part of the brain. The, the wrinkly part of the brain yeah, is the cortex. Yeah. Okay. So that's the occipital lobe. The auditory information, mm -hmm. okay? To get sent to this part of the brain, the temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's called the temporal lobe? Um, mm, touch, okay. Mm -hmm. Get sent to the, um, actually it can get sent to two places, mm -hmm. either the parietal, it's up here, mm -hmm. or the somatosensory cortex, which is up yeah. here, okay. okay. Um, so that processes those particular experiences. If you're wondering where smell goes, Okay. Mm -hmm. Smell actually doesn't take the same path. Smell has its own particular special path. And that's from the, no the nose, which is mm -hmm. the sensory organ, mm -hmm. to the olfactory bulbs, which are actually two big kind of like yeah. 
maybe mm -hmm. maybe they're a little maybe they're like this big i don't know mm -hmm. oh. no, probably <laughs> yeah yeah i think yeah, that's smaller. a little bigger yeah. <laughs> so these there are two bulbs that are uh just there mm -hmm. like um i think behind the nose yeah mm -hmm. Maybe somewhere there also a little bit behind the eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see, I see. So it goes from your nostrils straight to mm -hmm. the um, olfactory bulbs that processes mm -hmm. uh, smell directly. Okay? So it doesn't go through the thalamus anymore. It does not. Mm -hmm. So isn't that interesting? Your, your, your sense of smell has its own pathway that is different from the, all, all the other senses. Why is that? Okay. Um, now let's go to the evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because... Because when you ask questions like that, why did you're actually asking, why did human beings develop or adapt mm -hmm. that particular uh, physical trait, which is uh, the, no, the sense of smell goes straight to the olfactory bulbs and doesn't follow the same pathway? Well, it's for our survival. Okay? Mm -hmm. Our sense of smell is something that needs to be immediately processed mm -hmm. because it's probably the thing mm -hmm. that will help, well, that will tell us whether or not to eat something mm -hmm. so um so yeah so that's mm -hmm. why that's why it goes straight smell your the... food yes <laughs> <laughs> smell your food for your own survival mm -hmm. if it's bad for you it probably smell bad yeah. and don't mm -hmm. eat it mm -hmm. okay so so yeah so it's a it's an adaptation it, it's a survival mechanism okay mm -hmm. so anyway okay. going back to, the, yes. to, to our awareness okay mm -hmm. so our brain uh, will process this information okay so the occipital lobe okay mm -hmm. processes visual information mm -hmm. and so one part of it processes literally what we see mm -hmm. okay so just the act of seeing is already one part of your occipital lobe is already devoted to processing that and what do i mean seeing something and understanding what you see are two different things mm -hmm. right? right so if i look at this this pin you watch you know, yeah. um um avatar avatar yes yes do you recognize it uh it's one of the the, the spirits of the yeah moon. yeah yeah right so mm -hmm. okay so you recognized it mm -hmm. because of a memory. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but if you just see it, what does it look like? Just describe what you see, not what mm -hmm. you know. It would be a black, somewhat cylindrical, curved structure. Okay, so it's curves. You see the curves. With, mm -hmm. you Outlined see the color. by gold. Yes. This is, so there's black, there's white, mm -hmm. there's gold, there are mm -hmm. lines, etc. And it seems shiny. Yeah, yeah. Very shiny, right? Mm -hmm. So that's you seeing it, mm -hmm. okay? And that's uh, that part of your brain that's in charge of that is called um, the primary. Oh no, not all folks, sorry. <laughs> uh, the primary visual cortex, mm -hmm. okay? So um, the primary visual cortex is in charge of seeing, but the vis uh, the association cortex, the visual association cortex is the one that says, oh, I've seen this before mm -hmm. and I know what it is. So it connects what you are seeing now to a memory. Mm -hmm. If you've seen that, the thing yes, we're talking the about. Yes, <laughs> seen the show. Um, it's a great yeah. show. Yeah. It, will, it will recognize it. Mm -hmm. And that's how, uh, this is a particular example, but imagine if you have never seen a chair before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will a chair look like to you? It will just look like a bunch of wooden planes uh, stacked up. Okay, together. that's if you've seen wood before. Oh, that's true. It could be <laughs> right. like a bunch of boards. Or it will lines. just be shapes. Yes, or yes, right? yes, yes. Right? It will just be lines, shapes, it's, uh, three dimensional. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you've seen a chair before and you you know what the chair looks like, mm -hmm. that's where the association cortex to activate and recognize. Mm -hmm. That's the fact that you know it's made of wood means you know what wood is, you've seen mm -hmm. it before, mm -hmm. and you know, okay, this is wood, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how the occipital lobe works mm -hmm. to process visual information. Mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of the same way how our temporal lobe works. Okay, So there is, we can register sound, but understanding sound is the work of the, associ the auditory association cortex. Mm -hmm. okay? um, that's a little bit how the parietal lobe and the somatosensory cortex mm -hmm. works, but it's a little bit more complex because those parts of the brain um, also process things like position of the body, body temperature, mm -hmm. um, so just a little more complex. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. But in general, the parietal lobe um, is for that. There's a part that recognizes uh, the, it's like pure sensorial experience versus mm -hmm. understanding the sensorial experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are two different things. Mm -hmm. And here we already begin to see that memory, uh, awareness of things has a lot to do with memory. You can be seeing things, but if you don't remember anything, then our awareness would always be new. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. that's why you know you're knowing your primary cortices, okay, the thing, the things that are that allow you to actually process sight and sound, and etc. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. That's not all that your brain is for. Your brain is also for associating things to uh, past experiences and past um, knowledge that you've registered already actively all the time. And that's something that creates what we now know as experience. Mm -hmm. right? That's why you can um, look at me and not, oh, what are you, alien? Yeah. No, you know what a human being looks like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so there, that's mm -hmm. one part of what creates our awareness. But it mm -hmm. doesn't end there. Mm -hmm. We've not even talked about this part of the brain mm -hmm. called the frontal cortex. Frontal right? cortex. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so far, occipital. Which is for um, seeing, for sight. Seeing, and right. Tem temporal. That's for hearing things. Right. Parietal. And that's for uh, body sensory re reception or knowing your the body positioning yeah yeah or a little bit of taste a little bit mm -hmm. of touch right? mm -hmm. somatosensory cortex okay mm -hmm. um that's mostly for association okay yes. for knowing what taste is what touch is uh, what this feels like etc mm -hmm. okay. and so we, there are two more parts there's a frontal lobe okay or the frontal cortex mm -hmm. and then the motor cortex Okay, which is this this part here. So right. somatosensory motor. Okay. <laughs> I hope the people mm -hmm. who are oh man, so the people who are listening. Well, I hope the people who are just listening are, are looking at the uh at, at the picture of the an illustration. Picture. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Um so what are those for? Okay, now I say I always say that the frontal cortex is actually the seat of um, consciousness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we process it in all of these other places, but we put it together into an integrated experience that we understand in the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, you're sitting at home, you're watching a podcast and you're understanding what I'm saying because you're able to think about it via your frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. Maybe right now you're thinking about, huh, how is that true in my own experience? How is this relevant in my own experience? Mm -hmm. The questioning part of you that allows you to think that is here. Mm -hmm. right? So right. higher processes, mm -hmm. higher an analytical thinking, mm -hmm. higher um, yeah, wondering, mm -hmm. questioning, being critical. Mm -hmm. That's all mm -hmm. the processes that are found here. Okay, so it's this part of your brain is actually quite, mm -hmm. quite important. <laughs> so even our personalities are... Yes. Um, well, um, ah, not to be too, too technical, but mm -hmm. personality does involve a lot of other things too, oh, um, mm -hmm. like the midbrain, which I actually haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, thinking happens here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the motor cortex, okay, is for responding to our thinking, which is mm -hmm. our movement. Mm -hmm. The movements of our body are responses to. Um, our environment, okay? So I like to think sometimes that our body is like input-output. Input is sensory, 
So the pathway I just described is called the sensory pathway from receptors to the brain, okay, to the cortices for processing, to the frontal cortex for understanding. Mm -hmm. And then the front, frontal cortex, once it understands what happens, uh, it can send signals to the motor cortex mm -hmm. for you to act, and that's the output. Okay, so okay. right now, if you just if you understood anything I said, mm -hmm. you'd be like, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> if you didn't understand anything I said, you'd be like, ah, uh, what's that? Okay, mm -hmm. so if you're scratching your head, that's a motor response. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. because you didn't understand. <laughs> now you're scratching your head in confusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a behavior that involves the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. Because the motor cortex is what your brain uses to send signals to the various parts of the body so you move. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, so far, we have covered the hind brain, the, the central nervous mm -hmm. system, which is the brain and the spinal mm -hmm. cord, mm -hmm. and the peripheral nervous system, which are mm -hmm. the series of nerves and um, everything else aside from mm -hmm. the brain and the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So the sensory pathway and the motor pathway. Okay. Um, so we touched upon all of that mm -hmm. and all of those again are relevant in our experience. Mm -hmm. We're able to move because of the motor pathway and the motor, uh, cortex. We are able to experience the world and know things because of the sensory pathway and the sensory cortices. Mm -hmm. We're able to be alive and function because mm -hmm. of the automatic processes of the, of the hindbrain. Mm -hmm. also connected to the autonomic nervous system, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is the part of us that uh, handles the, those organs that mm -hmm. I just... The automatic just, processes. Right. That, yeah. The heart, yeah. the lungs, the digestive system. Mm -hmm. um, there's one part of the brain and one part of human experience that is very important, okay? That we are actually probably aware of all the time. Um, but maybe we don't like so much. Okay? <laughs> and that's the midbrain. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because the midbrain is uh, particularly this part of the midbrain called the limbic system. Mm -hmm. That's the part where we, where we feel our emotions, okay? where we feel our basic drives, mm -hmm. like the drive to eat, the drive to sleep, mm -hmm. the drive to drink, uh, yeah, so being thirsty, all of these basic things about being human, that's where we feel it. So awareness of our emotions is something also that we can be aware of. I mean, what's any experience if it doesn't make us feel anything, right? I mean, the experiences we remember, the experiences that mean anything to us are probably experiences that have some kind of emotional um, component. And the part of our brain that deals with that emotional component is in the midbrain. Mm -hmm. There are two parts, probably, that I want to focus on. Um, one part, uh, three parts, okay. Mm -hmm. One okay. part is called the amygdala. Okay? Amygdala. All right. So, Right now, for example, mm -hmm. are you feeling nervous? It's like, oh my God, there's so many terms <laughs> yeah. and all these things I need to memorize. Mm -hmm. and I'm talking so fast. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. The amygdala is activated when we feel things like that. When we are nervous, mm -hmm. okay? when we are um, afraid of something, okay? mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, maybe teachers make us nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or uh, something new, like a new experience, right? Mm -hmm. This whole um, studying in this way, studying at home, um, it's, it's new. So new things can make us nervous. Mm -hmm. okay? So those are the things that activate the amygdala. Okay? And the amygdala is a very special part because it's related to a few other things that maybe we'll talk about later. Um, but the amygdala is the part of the brain that registers threat and remembers threatening things. So when the amygdala activates, okay, that's what we know, for example, as a stressful experience. Mm -hmm. So what's a stressful experience like for you? What happens to your body when you're, you undergo a stressful experience? Mm 
So it feels like your chest gets tight and your breathing, uh, your breath gets short, your heart rate goes up. Mm -hmm. So the amygdala, so, yeah. yeah, this is in charge of remembering these experiences and the sensations. Remembering and activating those experiences. Mm -hmm. So the amygdala is also kind of like a, it's like a watchtower, it's like mm -hmm. an alarm system that we have embedded mm -hmm. in our brains. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm hoping that people's amygdalas are not so activated right now. Mm -hmm. But if they are, okay, well, this is my this might be um, what is happening. Okay, mm -hmm. which is that some of the sensor sensory information gets uh, sent to the amygdala for processing, and the amygdala says, "Ha! What is this new experience?" Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and what that might activate okay, is related to something we've already talked about, like the medulla, the, mm -hmm. uh, the medulla mm -hmm. um, controls heart rate, controls mm -hmm. breathing, Basic controls function. um, mm -hmm. stomach functions. Mm -hmm. So the amygdala sends a signal okay, that activates changes in the parts of the body that I just mentioned. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it can activate what is called a uh, the body's sympathetic mode, which mm -hmm. is the body's stress mode. Mm -hmm. So your heart rate goes up, your your breathing gets labored, mm -hmm. you can feel knots in your stomach. Mm -hmm. So that's usually related to feelings of fear, mm -hmm. right? feelings yeah. of nervousness, or even feelings of excitement. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So excitement and anxiety actually are almost the same thing mm -hmm. they trigger the sympathetic nervous system. the sympathetic nervous system and so think about our feelings that are that are like that um we can use many different feelings many different feeling words and they might activate the same system just in different ways mm -hmm. okay like frustration might also might belong to that system mm -hmm. um Sadness might belong to that system. Okay, so the, there. So that's the part of our brain that has to do with that particular awareness. Um, maybe that's a good exercise to have actually. Think of hmm, what emotions do I associate with activation of the sympathetic system? Mm -hmm. That higher heart rate. <laughs> so that's or the opposite. If the amygdala is kind of deactivated, that's when you feel calm. That's mm -hmm. when the parasympathetic comes in, the parasympathetic system, which is our normal system. Mm -hmm. And that's when you feel calm. That's when you feel sleepy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so on. So that's the amygdala. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are other structures. So that's the amygdala. Okay. The Near the amygdala mm -hmm. is the structure called the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. and actually, it's like right by them. There are mm -hmm. dual structures too. So they're like twins. So there's two mm -hmm. amygdala and there's two hippocampi. Mm -hmm. Hippocampi. And the yes. hippocampus is the part of our brain that's in charge of um, processing and preparing for storage mm -hmm. of information into long-term memory. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Right. So, mm -hmm. Why do we want to know more about the hippocampus? Well, because you're in school and processing of information into long-term memory mm -hmm. would be very useful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so hopefully their hippocampi are quite active right now. All right. Yes. But what, how does the hippocampus work anyway? Okay. So again, the sensory information that, that is already being processed by the cortices mm -hmm. and the frontal cortex. And you're like, okay, I'll try to listen to what mom is saying, try to understand it, try to apply it to my life. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're thinking about examples okay, for yourself right now. But the thing is, uh, that information kind of goes back to the hippocampus, okay? And it goes there for processing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get processed immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah certain conditions need to be met for the hippocampus to process information into long-term memory. Okay, so what are those? It's sleep. Oh. The hippocampus so works and, and um, activates this process called consolidation while we sleep. Mm -hmm. So that's why sleeping is actually integral to memory formation. Mm -hmm. So our brain doesn't just completely, or consciousness doesn't completely shut 
off when we're asleep. So there are different things working in the background that allow us to yes. make sense of information even when we're awake. Right, right. There. So the hippocampus uh, is involved with um, yeah formation of long-term mm -hmm. memories. The amygdala is involved with um, memories regarding threats mm -hmm. <laughs> and threatening feelings okay, mm -hmm. or fears. Mm -hmm. um, you could also ask why. Why is there a special part of the, the brain that's yeah. in charge? Why have of we that? evolved to have that specialized structures for fear detection? So that we could survive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting, mm -hmm. right? There, there are really um, special parts of the brain that help us survive. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but the last part of the brain that I wanted to discuss is. I'm not actually sure if this is in the book, but I thought mm -hmm. it was important to point out. It's this part of the limbic system that's called the dopamine reward system. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So let's just call it that. I think before in my classes, I used to specify this was like the palladium, the ventral mm -hmm. palladium, the ventral tegmentum, tegmental area, etc. Mm -hmm. But let's not talk about that now. Mm -hmm. See, I can't even and remember it so <laughs> specifically <laughs> okay. but let's just say this is called the dopamine reward system and what is the dopamine reward system for okay so we've already talked about emotions like uh, excitement mm -hmm. fear nervousness mm -hmm. um, frustration okay um, the other side uh, the other feelings okay that we might uh, think of that we feel like for example happiness pride um, uh, excite, um, elation, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and all these are more positive feelings. Where are they found in the brain? And the answer is they are found in the dopamine reward system. Okay. And okay. this part of the brain is in charge of the feeling of accomplishment and joy and excitement mm -hmm. and happiness mm -hmm. when we finish a task. Okay. So it can be um, for example, finishing a task or winning a game or yeah. watching a movie that we like yes. or eating something that we love the right. taste of yeah right because all of those are tasks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right because when you're going to eat something that you like you know it so you are you're actually your brain actually goes into anticipation mode and then when you finally eat it you're like yes mm -hmm. and then yeah. so the dopamine reward system fires mm -hmm. uh you know the neurons are activate so um the things that make us happy, actually, and the things that motivate us, it's it's uh, an interaction between our anticipation of it and then the having of it. Mm -hmm. okay? And th that's the thing that makes us feel happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it makes that, us want to do things again. Yes. yes. Okay. So there. So that's the dopamine reward system. And there, actually, in the past, I don't know how long I've been mm -hmm. talking now. It's mm -hmm. been like 40 minutes or something. <laughs> I just went through most of the brain <laughs> parts. Yeah. So you can see that all of them have to do with our awareness and our experiences as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, happiness, sadness, uh, appreciation of and understanding of the things you see or the things you hear, food, um, breathing, <laughs> um, missing people, Hippocampus, okay? Mm -hmm. you, you miss them because you remember them, okay? Mm -hmm. You miss them because you anticipate seeing them and you want them, mm -hmm. the dopamine reward system. Mm -hmm. So absolutely any experience that a human being can have is rooted and can be traced to particular functioning of the brain. Uh, and uh, yeah, there. So welcome to your brain, people. Yeah. How about like, how can things alter our state of consciousness that are from the external world? For example, how come when we drink alcohol, it can um, slow down our mental processing or make us feel uh, differently? Or if we take certain medications, it changes okay. the way we think or the way we feel. Or the way we, yeah, our ability to focus, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So uh, we've already talked about neurons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So actually our brain is made up of neurons. Mm -hmm. So all, most of the parts of our brain 
are, are activated. When I say activated, it, I mean the neurons are firing. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so electrical impulses are mm -hmm. are are happening. Now, aside from um, just activation of neurons, there are these things that are found in the brain mm -hmm. or in the neurons mm -hmm. that neurons release or or suck up. Okay? <laughs> so they release it or they take them in again mm -hmm. in the cells mm -hmm. called neurotransmitters. Okay? Mm -hmm. Neuro and neurotransmitters, I like to think of neurotransmitters as the language mm -hmm. with which uh, the different parts of the brain mm -hmm. communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's also what causes our um, our ability to understand things, to focus, to feel happy, to feel mm -hmm. sad. These are actually also things that concern neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I'll explain neurotransmitters by talking about the different substances that we take, mm -hmm. maybe on a daily basis, or activities that we do, maybe on a daily basis, that affect our neurotransmitter mm -hmm. levels. Okay? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, okay, um, when you, uh, for example, you have been craving for um, salmon sashimi. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that's a classic. Maybe you've yes. been craving for it for days, mm -hmm. and because you've been craving for it, um, your dopamine reward system is activated, mm -hmm. and then the moment you eat it the dopamine reward system starts firing mm -hmm. and activating yeah, and releasing you feel happy dopamine. and satisfied by the yeah, taste releasing and releasing dopamine having it. in your brain okay mm -hmm. so dopamine released in your brain feels like happiness mm -hmm. actually that is what happiness is mm -hmm. <laughs> um it's literally a, yeah. it's so, the chemical response yeah the, so mm -hmm. dopamine is released okay um so it doesn't have to be any weird substance. It mm -hmm. can just be you eating your favorite food. Mm -hmm. okay? Suppose after all of this, okay, for example, um, you met somebody online, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you've not met this person mm -hmm. in person because of the quarantine. Okay? Mm -hmm. but maybe you're super close now. Maybe you've mm -hmm. actually been talking for the past four months, okay? mm -hmm. but you still can't see each other. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the day you see each other, what happens to your brain is actually the same thing. It's the dopamine releasing and it makes you feel high. Yes. You are Finally, high. I'm able to see that person. Right. It, it was worth the wait. And all the anticipation just made it that right. more exciting. Right. Yeah. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. okay? It's a chemical in your brain that triggers this particular feeling. Joy, mm -hmm. happiness, elation, okay? high moods. Mm -hmm. okay? Interestingly, dopamine is actually also important in the processes of the frontal cortex. Mm. Okay? So dopamine as a neurotransmitter is important with helping us make decisions, um, um, focus, uh, um, make uh, critical analysis. Okay? But that's not dopamine in your dopamine pathway that's dopamine in your frontal cortex okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay. so it it means different things in different places mm -hmm. okay. all right um so that's eating salmon sashimi mm -hmm. or seeing yeah. your crush okay mm -hmm. or i also described um focusing on a problem that's mm -hmm. also dopamine mm -hmm. okay now what's another what, what's uh you mentioned alcohol mm -hmm. okay a substance that can be ingested that affects consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, drinking alcohol actually stimulates uh, the release first. Okay, the release of this neurotransmitter called GABA. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, G A B A. And GABA, when it is released in the brain, um, gets people to um, basically to relax. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when people relax, their inhibitions go down. Mm -hmm. And that's why when people get drunk, they may get mm -hmm. um, loose motor control. So mm -hmm. they'll start hitting things and they'll get sluggish. Or saying um, things slur. Yeah, they don't yeah. want to say. <laughs> yeah. So, or you lose inhibition in the mm -hmm. whole fact that you 
control of yourself. So mm-hmm. maybe you say things that you didn't mm-hmm. want to, um, that embarrassed you or yeah. something. So that's GABA. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another thing that gets uh, that goes up when you drink alcohol is serotonin. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then and serotonin is uh, uh, a neurotransmitter that really affects our mood. Okay. Mm-hmm. So high levels of serotonin um, makes us feel um, emotional. Okay? Mm-hmm. So if we're happy, we feel extremely happy. If we're sad, ah, oh, that's when we cry. Okay? Mm-hmm. So um, it triggers high emotional mm-hmm. states. Okay. So we have the happy drunks and we have the crying drunks. Mm-hmm. And we have the, I love you, I love everyone mm-hmm. drunks. Mm-hmm. Okay? And that's because of high serotonin. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, if you drink a lot, and you drink a lot, how do you feel the next day? Uh, you feel lethargic you feel nauseous sometimes okay so all right mm-hmm. so hangovers can be yeah. a, a lot of different things mm-hmm. um but actually when you're younger usually it's just because you're dehydrated so mm-hmm. just drink lots of water mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> hydrate but, people but um another thing that can be the cause of a hangover is that the uh, next day okay after having your serotonin go up Mm-hmm. Okay, but artificially because it's a substance you're taking that triggers the release of serotonin. Mm-hmm. Sometimes what happens is the next day you have a serotonin crash. Mm-hmm. Okay, because okay. your the serotonin that your brain was ready to produce mm-hmm. and re- was released. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, then there's not enough serotonin for the next day. Mm-hmm. How people might feel okay, when they're hungover is they're very, they can be very irritable. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. they can uh, be very moody, mm-hmm. irritable, anxious. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. because this is what happens when the brain has too little serotonin. Mm-hmm. Either moody, irritable, anxious. Okay, because mm-hmm. particular parts of the brain in the frontal mm-hmm. cortex don't have enough serotonin. Mm-hmm. Or you can also be um, unable to focus mm-hmm. um, because yeah, your serotonin mm-hmm. is too low. Mm-hmm. So. Those are some, but then there are others. Um, there are other uh, neurotransmitters, transmitters, mm-hmm. like, like, like for example, when you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what why do we feel that? such a rush uh, after we work out, and we feel really happy, and we, generally our mood is lighter? So yeah. would that be? Um, do, you, do you know what it is? Endorphins, right? Yes, endorphins. So what do endorphins make us feel? Is it similar to the dopamine response? There's like a sense of reward or a sense of elation or happiness? Actually, endorphins in particular, it's more of, the, um, it's like the feeling of um, your body being light. Mm-hmm. So when you feel really good after a workout, it's two things. It's dopamine. Because mm-hmm. you're like, yeah, I did it. I accomplished something. And it's endorphins. Mm-hmm. Um, and endorphins basically, uh, it, it, it makes, it's that, it's that kind of like peppy feeling. Yeah, <laughs> where you, yeah, don't, yeah. you don't feel. Yeah, you don't feel the pain, pain. almost. <laughs> you don't yeah. feel the physical pain mm-hmm. um, because of endorphins. And then when the endorphins wear out, then mm-hmm. you feel the physical pain. Mm-hmm. But you can still be proud of yourself because mm-hmm. of your dopamine. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So, okay. Um, so in what situations is it okay or not okay to alter our state of consciousness? So when are we, uh, when are we supposed to take certain kinds of medications or stay away from certain kinds of medications that can affect us physically? Oh, wow. What a hard question you're asking me. <laughs> um, I don't know. (laughs) To tell you the truth, I don't know how to answer that question because who can answer that question but the person, I guess in general. um, Here's actually a conversation that happens in circles of psychologists and circles of philosophers, which is the question of what is the ideal state? Mm -hmm. What is the ideal state of a human being? And my personal um, stand here is that I don't know. I cannot determine for myself what the ideal state of another human being is. 
And since substances that we ingest, even food that we eat, are things like coffee, caffeine, um, or, or chocolates, mm -hmm. or sugar, or even normal things, they don't, mm -hmm. don't have to be uh, uh, substances like alcohol, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or um, medicines, or drugs. Mm -hmm. All of these things that we ingest have some kind of alteration to our state. Mm -hmm whether we ingest it or don't ingest it, whether we do this behavior or don't do that behavior. Mm -hmm. But the main question is, what is the ideal human state? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my opinion, and this is really my personal opinion, and this is an opinion I have formed through my years also of doing therapy, mm -hmm. that what is good for me may not necessarily be good for somebody else. And it is not my role to impose on that other person that, this is what the good state is mm -hmm. now uh, that sounds very simplistic because some people don't know what is best for them like mm -hmm. what about people who um really have problems with um addiction mm -hmm. or really have problems with self-harm for mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. um so it is the task of the human being hopefully mm -hmm. to find a way for them to know what their ideal state is. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, it's, it's a philosophical question. You have to find out what your ideal state is. And mm -hmm. then when you find that out, it is your responsibility to give that to yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, I know that sounds like a very big, uh, this is a very long conversation. Mm -hmm. If they're interested, they can send in the <laughs> questions for the Q&A. Um, yeah. But yes, I think first and foremost, uh, we cannot really police, uh, you know, what is mm -hmm. the ideal state for anybody. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think that is each person's personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So when do we know whether it's okay or not? Well, um, hope the ideal is that we all seek out uh, what is ideal for us. And when we find out what that is, then mm -hmm. we can kind of make a recipe for our bodies mm -hmm. that can help us achieve that. Mm -hmm. well, and what is that recipe? It, it's, also, it's our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's how are you going to eat mm -hmm. this? How many hours of sleep are you going to get? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of workout are you going to do? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of behaviors are you going to do? Are you going to be a, shout, a person mm -hmm. who shouts when they're mm -hmm. angry or does deep breathing? Mm -hmm. These are the things that will alter will truly alter our state of consciousness. And that's what counts. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's say we do gravitate towards, uh, or the, um, the brain and the spinal cord and the entire nervous system, our bodies, we're um, not infallible beings. So we're not infallible organisms. So we get hurt. Um, things can hurt our nervous system. Things can hurt our brains. So is the brain or is our nervous system capable of repairing itself? And how do we see that in everyday life? Okay. Um, one really short answer mm -hmm. to that is the moment you're able to learn anything, mm -hmm. for example, teach yourself a skill, teach yourself how to draw or teach yourself how to read or Teach yourself how to cook, which a lot of us are doing right now, right? Mm -hmm. All of these changes in behavior are, is uh, a product of this phenomena mm -hmm. called neuroplasticity, okay? Mm -hmm. Because neuroplasticity in and of itself is not just about the ability of our brain to recover or heal itself. Mm -hmm. It's the ability of our brain to adjust, okay? Mm -hmm. For neurons to rewire themselves into a particular task, Okay? And when we learn a new behavior, that's our brain learning a new task. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and the more you do it, the more you remember it, the better you are at it, then the more that um, string of neurons firing in a particular way, um, it changes. You literally change your brain when you try something new. Mm -hmm. When we learn new skills. You learn something new. Mm -hmm. okay? So um, that's basically what neuroplasticity is. Mm -hmm. So 
it's actually something that just happens all the time, every day. Mm -hmm. And this really shows like uh, that our brains are so adaptive. Mm -hmm. They're so, they can be very, very flexible. Mm -hmm. And so what's great about that and what, what that tells us is that, and research does show us, it does come out um, that when we, for example, people get hurt, okay, or, or um, you know, there's damage to this brain part or that brain part, mm -hmm. um, because of this ability of our brain to be plastic, to be moldable, to, mm -hmm. to change, then um, it also uh, puts into focus our ability, the ability of our brain to adjust, okay. I wouldn't, necessarily say heal itself mm -hmm. okay but to adjust so that the functioning can be done in another place okay um so the brain knows almost knows how to adjust itself mm -hmm. so that um it learns okay mm -hmm. much like we learn new skills the brain can learn um yeah the brain mm -hmm. um the brain can learn new skills okay mm -hmm. or can transfer functions to a different place if one place doesn't work anymore, okay, and um, so on. So knowing this, okay, the neuroplasticity of the brain and how often we use it actually highlights the importance of learning mm -hmm. okay? uh, and practicing skills. Mm -hmm. Because when we do that, um, we are training our brain to be more plastic and less mm -hmm. rigid. And that's actually good for the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so there are lots of studies about aging. Okay, mm -hmm. people who are aging are uh, um, there's this old idea that when you age, you stop doing things. Mm -hmm. Right, and we actually find that no, that's not. That's actually absolutely do not do that because if you stop doing things, then the brain becomes rigid. And that's where some problems come up, like, you know, dementia and, um, yeah, forgetting. Mm -hmm. So they say, keep the brain active, keep mm -hmm. learning new things, keep, mm -hmm. keep doing the skills that you know, because mm -hmm. the brain needs to stay, like, plastic mm -hmm. and adapting. And so and always engage learning. and activate and so we can right. continually learn and absorb and process new information. Right. So... Just to round out our discussion, what are ways, and, and knowing the integral connection between the mind and the body, how can we take care of ourselves and keep ourselves, our, our nervous system and our bodies in a, uh, a, a healthy or an optimal state of functioning? Okay. Since you started with a question about how awareness works, mm -hmm. I will end this, this uh, podcast with really the importance of awareness okay? Mm -hmm. okay and i will give it a particular name and and describe it um, as a particular skill and it's called body awareness okay? mm -hmm. so body awareness actually takes a little bit of uh skill okay mm -hmm. uh, you need to develop body awareness although some people actually have it quite more naturally mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. others okay? mm -hmm. But body awareness, meaning awareness of what your body feels, like for example, your heart rate. Are you sensitive to your heart rate? Mm -hmm. Are you sensitive to your stomach? Do you know when you're hungry? Or are you inclined to ignore it all the time? Mm -hmm. right? Do you know when your muscles are tense? Or do you just notice it when they're super tense and they hurt? Mm -hmm. Okay. Increasing body awareness means increasing your sensitivity to your body. Mm -hmm. And why is that a good thing? Well, um, if you are more sensitive to your body, meaning, for example, you're more sensitive to your muscles, you're more sensitive to um, your heart rate, mm -hmm. it actually teaches you to be more sensitive to your emotions. Because if you can catch your heart rate, it's like, oh, why is my heart rate up? Oh, it's like, oh, I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? Okay. Um, and so it allows you to know yourself better. If you are sensitive to your muscles, you're like, oh, why are my muscles tense? And then um, you can catch yourself before it becomes like your body is screaming at you, you're nervous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, even just a little bit of change, you can catch it. And what that allows you to do actually is to kind of like, it's kind of like your body has an early warning system, right? Even if it's just a slight change, you can listen to it and then interpret it and then act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So um, the more sensitive you are to your body, the more you can take care of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So maybe as we go along, we will draw stronger connections to, for example, in the next module, the body and how we learn. Okay? So um, the more we build our knowledge of mm -hmm. psychology, I'll try to connect it a lot to the body because much of what we can do, much of what we have control of in our life actually stays here. Mm -hmm. just stays in this particular realm, our bodies. We can't control a lot of other things like mm -hmm. people, the weather, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. But this, this is where most of our control is. And the more we are aware of it, the more we can take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, I guess that rounds out our discussion on why discussing the biological perspective is very important for understanding. And it's like the foundation for understanding the uh, other topics in psychology. So next time, we'll be discussing uh, more on learning and memory and always connecting it to how we, uh, how our bodies uh, make sense of the Hopefully, if I remember. Okay. <laughs> okay. All, right. All right. Okay. okay. So that's it for today. Thank yeah. you, Ina. And... Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. All right. See you.